Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Flesch, uh, the director of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of three talks uh, hosted here at the museums this fall by illustrious historian James B. Hibbard on the topic of slavery and free black miners in Platteville. So the title of tonight's talk is Slavery in Platteville Part 1, The Mitchell Family. So among uh, tonight's uh, sold out audience of 100 participants, I'm delighted to see so many friends of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums, which are our museum's members, uh, leaders of the city of Platteville and the UW Platteville, and, and so many new faces. Programs such as this lecture series help to keep our museums a wonderful regional resource for lifelong learning in natural history, cultural history, and science and industry. And because you're all here tonight, the museums are not only a place where history is preserved, but also where the sense of place of our driftless region and the pioneering legacy of our people can be shared with the next generation. So if you're not already a member of the museums or a donor to the museum's annual fund, I'd like to invite you to explore the benefits of membership and all the ways that your contributions enable the museums to survive and to thrive, especially in these times of COVID-19. So uh, please visit our website, www.mining.jameson.museum slash donate. Um, I'd also like to thank those whose financial support made tonight's presentation possible. Uh, thank you to our sponsor, Shake Rag Alley Center for the Arts, who invites uh, participants of this lecture series to join its NEA Big Read of a book called Citizen, an American Lyric, which addresses the individual and collective effects of racism. I'd also like to thank the following participants who did offer a free will donation in order to attend tonight's event. That includes uh, Denise Cardot, Jan Holloway, A. Alanda Gregory, D. Wolf, Ron Wire, Anne Austin, Marty Klon, Jacqueline Thomas, and Angie Wright. Thank you. And now, before I introduce our speaker and we begin our program, I'd like to invite you to participate in a question and answer session at the end. Um, again, I invite you to type out your questions as they come to mind and to submit them via the chat function at the bottom of the screen. You may not know about James that uh, he earned his Master of Library Science with an emphasis on archival studies at Indiana University Bloomington. He's been with the university as the archivist at uh, UW Platteville since the year 2000. An avid researcher, he has presented his research at history conferences including several Wisconsin Historical Society, local history and historic preservation conferences. In addition, he's published two books on the history of Platteville and the Lancaster, Wisconsin. Uh, James's articles have appeared in the Wisconsin Magazine of History, Atlanta Historical Journal, and other periodicals. Please join me in welcoming James. Uh, this is Jim Hibbert. Um, tonight's is September 17th, presentation of Slavery in Platteville, Part 1, the Mitchell Family. And then there will be two more presentations that you see on your screen, uh, Part 2, the Roundtree Family in a month. And then in November, we'll have uh, Black Lead Miners of Platteville, the story of William Maxwell. Um, I hope you can join us. I'd like to start out with a story tonight. Um, the story is Christmas Eve, 1841. Uh, they've just had a, a beautiful snowfall a couple days before, so people are all excited they can, they can hop in their sleighs, or at least their sleighs up to their horses and go. And they had this big um, Christmas ball, big enough that a person wrote about it and put it in the um, Kalina newspaper, uh, quite a long article. And in any case, they talk about um, it, was a, it was a night of reverie, weary dances that they ate, they drank. And they uh, they danced the night away. Some of them did not make it home until the morning. The sun was up, and they had this wonderful time. They they had their top hats on. They had their Sunday best on, so to speak. And and you have that beautiful moment just across town. This would be that was course in Blackwell near Second Street. Just across town, you had you had two enslaved girls who were uh, at Reverend James and Lakeisha Mitchell's house uh, at the corner of. Uh, Chestnut and Maine, and they um, there's there was a border there. He was he was there for about a year and a half, and he wrote about the girls. He said, uh, uh, "quote He said he knew the colored girls to have been used hardly, 
that they frequently or usually had to sleep on the floor or the or hearth with nothing except some old garments to put under them and cover them. And that they never went to school or Sunday school or meeting unless to take care of the child from Mrs. Leticia Mitchell. So you have you have this dichotomy, this this really paradox going on, this contradiction, where you have this beautiful party here, two blocks away, you have two enslaved young girls. They were 14 and 6, 14 and 7, right in there, I believe. So how did that happen? What was going on here? And that's the story of tonight. Uh, to begin with, this story begins back in Virginia, and it begins with the Mitchells, Samuel Mitchell and Eleanor Thomas Mitchell. Uh, that was, uh, they were, uh, he was, Samuel was uh, a Revolutionary War veteran. He, uh, and he becomes a um, minister, Methodist minister, in 1789. In 1790, he has a religious epiphany. And he writes in his autobiography in the summer of 1790, after having my mind made up, made up on the subject of slavery, I emancipated my slaves, not seeing how I could compel a fellow creature to labor for me my, his whole life for nothing, and yet un, do unto others as I could wish them to do unto me. So for the rest of his life, it's interesting, he, he preached against slavery from the pulpit as well as just in general conversation. He's always talking, you know, against it, which is a wonderful thing. He had, he doesn't write his autobiography how many slaves he actually freed, except for I suspect it was six to eight, somewhere in there. So he frees his slaves. He lived at the time um, in southwestern Virginia, He'd be about where Roanoke is today. And uh, he educated his children about it and he spoke about it. He lives there, he has a pretty big family. He had one wife who died and a couple of kids with her, and then he marries Eleanor, and they have a lot more kids, and upwards of about eight to 10 kids. And he, in 1817, he moves over to Illinois, um, uh, sort of southwestern Illinois, um, in St. Clair County, which is opposite of St. Louis, Missouri. And he, uh, he goes there in 1817 and for, you know, raised his family and farms and whatnot. He, he went there pretty much as sort of the grass is greener kind of thing, but also he mentions that he went there because he, he, he was trying to get away from slavery. Uh, and he, in 1831, his father-in-law gives two slaves to his wife. It was a little, a little boy and a little girl. Uh, the boy was about five and the girl was four or something a little less. And, um, he takes them, being, remember, he's anti-slavery now. Um, he, he takes them right down to the courthouse the next day, as it mentions in the newspaper account here and whatnot, uh, and he frees them. He emancipates them at the St. Clair County Courthouse. Uh, and the, the boy's name was Henry Christopher. The girl's name has been lost to history. I don't know what her name was. But those, Henry and the, probably his sister, they lived with the, uh, the uh, Mitchells for more than a decade and a half. They lived in St. Clair County. And then when Samuel, in 1837 roughly, he comes up to Platteville. When he comes up to Platteville, uh, over the next, uh, he brings Henry with him and the little girl. And over the next couple of years, they built uh, the Stone House, which is now known as the Mitchell Boundary Stone Cottage. And they, um, they went ahead and um, they lived there for, well, about a decade and a half. And if you see, uh, there's a, I, I, I copied off the 1846 census there, as you can see, it's Henry Christopher, I circled Henry, um, Samuel Mitchell, it's, uh, four white males, uh, two white females, and males of color, one. That's, um, that's Henry. And he's in our census up until 1847. At the same time that he's, he's living with the Mitchells and the little girl, the little girl disappears. Right around 1841, she disappears. Uh, but Henry stays on, and he uh, he not only lives with him, he goes to church with him. This is the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church record, 1841-42. It's uh, he's the S and B that stands for he's single and he's baptized. Uh, and his name Henry Christopher, and that, that he's colored. And that's it was. It made my day when I found that. It's one of those things that when you're looking for these kind of things, and it's just this wonderful thing. 
In any case, uh, <clears throat> Stone Cottage, where it is located, in case you're unaware, it's sort of on the northwest side of, uh, of Platteville there. I've got it circled on the map. So that's where Henry lives. It's complete Henry's story. He, he stays on until 1847. And then in 1847, he's 21 years old. He, he drapes off as a young uh, man, a free man. He goes to Galena. He marries a lady there. Her name was Corinda. They have about five kids. Here's the 1860 census showing him with four here. They have one more, I believe. And then um, he lives in Galena and he, he works on the steamboats. He, he, did, he taught vocal music. He was in the confectionery business and he was a paper hanger. So he was sort of artistic as well. Oh, okay. He's, <coughs> I'll try my best, folks. I've never had a voice of projector that great, but I will try. Um, uh, anyway, he, he works, he works on the steamboats, uh, vocal music, business, confectionery, and a paper hanger. And he ends up, uh, the Civil War comes, he serves in the Civil War uh, as a musician in Company D of the 13th U.S. Colored Heavy Artillery. Uh, he comes home and he stays in Galena until 1879, he moves to Dubuque, lives there 10 years and passes away. In 1889, he's buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Gleenham. That's his, that's his military headstone. It took a while to find that headstone. I, I walked that cemetery to find it. Um, so he lives there, and, and it's, it's quite a remarkable story if you think that the Mitchells, here he had been a slave owner. He goes anti slavery on a moral crusade, so to speak. And he, um, he ends up uh, raising Henry and living here for Henry for over a decade and a half. Um, now let's move on to James Mitchell. James Mitchell was one of the sons of Samuel and Eleanor Mitchell. They had they had multiple, they had about four sons, I think. But he's one of the, he was born in 1813 in Virginia when they still uh, lived there. Um, and then in 1817, um, of course, he comes with his family over to St. Clair County, Illinois. In 1834, he becomes a uh, deacon. That's in the upper left corner. That's the uh, his uh, his uh, deacon papers there. And then um, in 1835, he gets married to uh, Letitia Burwell. Letitia, um, she was from from that area, and it, it shows because he gets married to her. She's from Virginia. They had obviously after they left Virginia, they had a, uh, a network back and forth letters, whatever. The, the Mitchells didn't uh, just cut off the social interaction between themselves and Virginia. So. There's very much social interaction there. And they went ahead and um, he gets married in January 20, 1835. I suspect in this house, the, the Burwells, there's at least this one estate house that, that they own. And this is probably the house they got married in, in January. They got married in their houses at that time. Um, anyway, his father in law had 50, in the 1830 census, his father in law had 55 slaves. So it shows you they were in, and his brother and another brother nearby had like 96 slaves. So they had quite a bit of slavery there. And they went ahead and um, one of the things they did as a wedding gift, they gave just like the Mitch, Samuel Mitchell, his father, uh, James's wife receives two slave girls, Alice and another girl who, whose name has also been lost in history, but Alice and this girl, probably sisters, um, are given to Letitia his wife. And they, they take the girls and they move over to, um, they, they go back to St. Clair uh, County in Illinois. And then at, next year, they move up to Platteville in 1836 and they bring the girls with them. And here's the 1840 census that I've outlined for you. On the left there, you can see uh, <coughs> James Mitchell and then all the numbers of the ages and stuff, basically. And then on the far right, uh, it's a free, free black females, 10 to 24 in age. That's, those are the two girls. And James was 27 at the time. Letitia was 22. And they had three kids. And so they're, they're in Platteville. And they're, um, he, he's a minister here, a Methodist minister. Who was James Mitchell? He's, he's, a, he's a fascinating character in the sense that he's definitely one of those rough and tumble kind of guys. Uh, he was because when you when you do research, at least what I do research, I like to figure out if you can what was that person's personality like, and he had quite the personality. He was uh, uh, 
the newspaper account in 1845 says he was a man that you did not trifle with, quote unquote, and that he carried a pistol in his belt. And, and another another minister, Methodist minister, came in town, Bartholomew Reed, the, the article on the, the right side of the screen. He comes in town a year later, and right away, James gets in into some sort of a argument with him. Um, and part of it is within a year, Bartholomew takes James to court in a, whatever the Methodist church used for court. It was within the church. He, was, he, he, uh, he took him to court within the church there. And he, he, basically his claim was his walk, Mitchell's, James Mitchell's walk was disorderly and unbecoming of a minister of the gospel of the Christian, or of a Christian, that he appeared on the ground with a pistol in his, in his belt. So you have this again, even Bartholomew. He doesn't. He doesn't say exactly how what we what he means by his walk is disorderly and unbecoming of a Christian. But it might have to do with the girls in slavery. I don't know. He never. I, I couldn't find any more on that point. So he's got problems there. And then this this other case on the lower left is is fascinating. Um, it says uh, the most about his personality. Uh, he on April well. On April 1st, 1840, you see he's taking the court here. I mean, from this paper. But back in 1839, James Vineyard had a uh, local. He had uh, he had taken uh, Mitchell to court over a debt to pay, and Mitchell basically said uh, Mitchell instead goes to Vineyard's house and uh, over in Osceola, which is basically the Potosi area, and he goes over there with force of arms. That means a weapon, a gun, and he takes he takes Mitchell's or he takes uh, uh, James Vineyard's. Uh, he seized, took, drove, and led away a certain iron gray horse from James R. Vineyard. Now to do that, this tells you a lot about James Mitchell because let me tell you just a bit about Vineyard. Vineyard is the one who, three years later in 1842, up in Madison, he's the one who famously or infamously. He shoots and kills Charles Arndt in the legislature. They're both, they're, they're both assemblymen over who's going to be sheriff in Grant County. He just shoots him point blank in the heart and kills him. And he gets off on that case. Um, and then in 1852, I ran across a diary entry of uh, Dr. James Campbell, who lived in uh, Platteville here. And he says Vineyard, Vineyard is a rather hard case. He had to break up a fight between Vineyard and Philip Pendershot, a harness maker, over $3 debt. So Vineyard's always, he just didn't, this guy was, he didn't mess with him because he would shoot you as well. So here James is stealing, James Mitchell is stealing his horse. That tells you what kind of a sort of a person he was. Um, while he's in Platteville, Mitchell also set up a, a store, J, the James Mitchell and Robert Bell store. Robert was a, was a brother-in-law. And they had upwards of $10,000 worth of goods there. At the same time, again, this sort of, sort of personality, they, they ran into a debt. They, they had an $893.30 debt to a company out in New York. And uh, Bell, Robert Bell, his partner, pays off his part of the debt. Uh, but it took John Roundtree, his brother-in-law, who represented this New York company in Wisconsin, three letters over 90 days to get James to pay his share of this bill. I'm sure he was... He was going up to um, uh, uh, Mitchell and saying, James, you've got to pay the bill. You've got the goods from New York, you've got to pay the bill. So he finally paid it um, August 15th, 1839 at noon. Um, so uh, even he was having problems with his only brother-in-law over his personality problems. At the same time, this is going on. James, James is actually quite successful. He's, of course, running a business now and then, and he builds a house at the corner of uh, the northwest corner of Main Chestnut Street, which is a gas station there today. He owns a 720 acre farm, which you see on the map there. That's roughly out where Walmart is. And he, um, that farm even makes the Madison newspaper where they say uh, James Mitchell has a beautiful farm. So he's in 1840. So he's, he's becoming established, becoming a pillar of the community of, of Platte. At the same time, remember, you've got the two girls, Alice and, the, and, the, and I believe the younger girl there. Um, and what he does is, uh, it's pretty sad. 
what he does is he, uh, I found this one court case. Um, again, this is part of the vineyard case, but he, it's a massive case, with massive paperwork in there. And I found this one piece of paper and he talks about, in the case he says, and in the further sum of $300 of like lawful of money for work and labor costs and diligence of the said defendant, by the, of the said defendant, meaning James Mitchell, by the said defendant Mitchell and his servants, those would be the girls, the slaves, before that time done, performed, and bestowed in and about the business of the said plaintiff and for the said plaintiff at his life request. The business of the said plaintiff was, let's know. So he, James, has, has forced these two young girls to work in a lead smelter. Um, in the midst of that, the smelter was located, it was the <coughs> Coats and Vineyard smelter on the, uh, as you look at the map there, um, Vineyard's house is that little square I had here. And then the other, the circle thing was the furnace. That's on Court Street, right where the roundabout is today, roughly on the Round Tree branch. And he forces the girls to work there for him, of course. They don't get paid any money. Um, and, uh, but think about it. Here you have these young girls. They're working in a hot, dirty, um, filthy place uh, with hot molten lead. You just don't know what's you know, going on there. And um, uh, for at least 1839, so it's, it's not exactly a place that you would ever have where uh, you have your the young girls work at, but James had them work at, which sort of tells you again, he's thinking in terms of they're just tools. They're not, they're not complete human beings in his mind. Um, that's his house with the little, uh, the bird's eye the lower right. That's his, that's his house. Probably it's the uh, house in 1839, 40 is probably just the front portion, but I think the rest would be an addition. And then so that's the gas station. So remember, every time you drive by that gas station, two young enslaved girls who lived at that site. For a while, it's, it's unbelievable that it's right here. So, what was Platteville like in 1841 uh, when this all this is going on? Uh, to understand it, first you have to go back to 1827, of course, that's when it was founded, and it was nothing but a dirt pile with lead miners all over the place. And it stayed that for quite a while until about 18, at least until 1835 36, after uh, it was platted. And once it was platted, then people could buy lots. Um, and then things started to change. Here's a, here's a description of it that I found in, from Elihu B. Washburn, he writes in 1840. Um, he's trying to convince this other person to come to Platteville to live. He says, the beautiful and lovely village of Platteville, Wisconsin, is just one of the best and prettiest little vigorous and flourishing towns I know of. Platteville has from 600 to 1,000 inhabitants and increasing fast, and it is in the heart of the great mining country. It has a newspaper, the Northern Badger, a high school, in the, which was Platte Academy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's talking about that's a I've got the the uh, masthead there of the Northern Badger. I was I would strongly suggest if any newspaper wants to rename itself, rename itself to the Northern Badger. I think that's a fantastic name for a Wisconsin newspaper. Um, at least I like it. And also Platte Platte also has has a uh, uh, there's another newspaper that's got a great name, long gone now, the Independent American. That was a platform newspaper. Um, in any case, 1841 was also the year that uh, Mr. Waters, Waters, a portrait painter, comes into town and he paints a portrait. That also tells you that Lang or that Platteville is growing, that a portrait painter is not going to stop into any town where he can't make some money. Uh, so Platteville's growing, it's becoming good. You also have the, I, I, in a larger sense, the Second Great Awakening is happening at this time, of which one of the reforms of that was the abolition of slavery. So if you want to look at the larger picture of history, think of the Second Great Awakening as well that's going on. So James is living, he came here in 1836 when it was still pretty much a dirt pile. And by 1840-41, it's becoming a town. And so it, in a sense, he's becoming a, uh, He's from a different era almost. Things are changing in Platteville. It's becoming more civilized or whatever you want to call it. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up to tonight is how is slavery, how, how did it happen up here? Um, because it go, if you go back to 1787, 
and you have the ordinance of 1787 and that northwest ordinance there that outlaws slavery there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in this territory which included ohio indiana illinois wisconsin and michigan and a little part of uh, minnesota that document is a fantastic document it sets up uh it sets up how we structure the rest of the states coming into the union basically and it, but it also had a precedent of where where they went it, it says you know including slavery was a wonderful thing but at the same time they had an 1840 census this is a map on the right of the 1840 census on the, on, on the southern part of the map you can see it's dark that's where the slaves are located this is the number of slaves per population that kind of thing but up in the corner there up in the southwest corner of wisconsin, of wisconsin there is that blowing up here that's the lead region that's and it has slaves uh you have it's grant county iowa county dubuque county iowa now iowa and um and uh, Joe Davies County, Illinois. And so those four counties have slaves in there. Um, one of the things to remember about the United States at this time, we were a collection of states, not really a nation state the way we are today. Um, the only, really the only interaction, there just was, there was no social net, there was, there was no uh, social security, no FBI, none of that. Um, and so the, uh, the idea of, uh, of people bringing their, their, their slaves up, not many did, but a few did. And you can see it, it, it involved, I think, human nature is, people can get away with something very clear and try to do it, it's just human nature. Um, and secondly, there was, there was very little enforcement of it. How could the federal government basically, um, on the East Coast, enforce this out, out this far out? But um, the states did, in a sense, uh, Illinois, ended up actually having codified slavery law in its, in its statutes, which I'll get into in another, in the next presentation. But anyway, the, the most interaction a person had with the uh, federal government was the U.S. mail. You'd have that once or twice a week, that's it. Other than that, people did not interact with the federal government very much at all. Um, Inter Reverend Edward Matthews, this is a fellow that you probably haven't heard of. He's a fascinating fellow. Um, uh, Reverend Edward Matthews blows up slavery in Wisconsin. Absolutely blows it out of the water. Um, he was born in England in 1812. 1835, he immigrates to New York. He, he was anti slavery from the beginning, um, a British autobiography there. And um, he was ordained a Baptist minister in 1838. And the same year, he becomes the minister at, the, at a Milwaukee a Baptist church. And then in the 1840s, he goes ahead and he basically lectures against slavery. And I'll show you some examples of what he did around here. And that's his signature there. It's quite the fancy signature. Anyway, he comes to, he comes over here and he does something very creative. He, uh, he looks at the, he gets a hold of the 1840 census. This would be in 1841 after it's already taken, of course. He gets a hold of the 1840 census and he looks to it who owns slaves. He wants to he wants to uh, fight this, and he finds six people who own slaves, or at least marked as owning slaves. Um, Thomas Parrish of, of Muscaday. This would be they're all in Grant County or Iowa County. Uh, John Ronsley of Platteville, Brayton Bushy, uh, Jonathan Craig, and Edward Lapper of the Potosi area, and then Philip Thomas of Middle Point. Ronsley's two slaves at this time was they were called Rachel, named Rachel Felix. And George Smith was actually the name of Philip Thomas. The rest, I don't know the names, unfortunately. Uh, but he found these six people owning 11 slaves. And the question that, that, the question that hit me instantly is how in the world, either these slave owners, how in the world did this get in the census? Either the slave owners were very arrogant or, or something else is going on. And I suspect, and so I looked up, I studied the enumerators. The census, the census in the 1840s, well, all on in the 19th century and early 20th, um, it wasn't sent to you in the mail. The, the census taker or enumerator would come to your door, knock on it, and you'd answer it, and he'd go ahead and, um, and ask you who lives in your house, what their ages are, that kind of stuff. And so they actually was in person interview. And James Durley had lived in Platteville, I think about, he's one of the early residents since the early 1830s. 
And uh, he had both him and Stephen Mahood of Lancaster. They were the two enumerators, which the county was divided between east and west, basically. And uh, they were anti-slavery all the way. James, in fact, put in his obituary that he was he had an intense, they put it, he had an intense hatred for slavery. And so you have these two guys, and they, they, they determined that these people are slave owners. Whether the slave owners admitted to it or not, uh, they were marked down as such by these two men. That's how they got into the census. I, I, I just, all of these guys are very savvy businessmen. I just don't see them flaunting the law that much where they're going to say, yeah, I own slaves, you know. When they knew, they knew it was against the law. In fact, it was against state law as well, or territorial law. Which I'll show you here in a second. Uh, in 1839, Wisconsin, the territory of Wisconsin, passed a, a, this law against slavery. It basically says you own slaves. If it's proven you own slaves, you're going to get two years in jail and a thousand dollar fine, up to. So that that would be pretty, you know, stiff. Um, and because of that, I don't think many people are going to announce to the uh, census enumerators that they own slaves. Uh, in any case. So we know that that punishment's out there by 1839. Uh, Reverend Matthews decided he, he had a plan. He, he, he came up with a plan, and his plan was: How do you get at how do you get at these slave owners? How do you get rid of slavery? It's on the books, but these people are still practicing it. How do you do this? And so his design, he goes into his autobiography and he says, "My design was the liberation of slaves held in Western Wisconsin." Western Wisconsin, he knew Southwest at that time, Wisconsin. If I could succeed in obtaining a decision from a civil court in Wisconsin that one slave was free, it would secure the freedom of all others who were held in the territory. And so what he needs is a, he needs paperwork, he needs documentation so he can take it to a grand jury, that's what he wanted to do. Uh, he learned from an abolitionist periodical that Reverend James Mitchell had two slave girls. He targeted Mitchell because he was a slave owner. He was the only slave owner in Wisconsin who was a minister. He says that, and, and if you think about it, when Matthews is a minister, he that, that, that's his world. So he, he he wants to, you know, we usually follow the path that we know. And he knew the religious world, and so he was going to go at. He was going to trying to shame James and anyone else into um, getting slavery, basically. In this case, but he needs documentation, so he has a plan. Um, which, and what he did, he goes to, of all people, Governor Henry Dodge, who actually had owned slaves. Henry Dodge in 1827 came up here from Missouri, uh, and he brought Tom Lear, who was a woman, Jim, Joe, and Toby. And he manumits them, frees them 10 years what, 1838. And uh, they actually gave land to Jim, Joe, and Toby, and Toby actually took Dodge's back. He must have treated him fairly well. Uh, and Governor and Matthews asked Dodge and a few other attorneys. Uh, he asked them in Wisconsin, they agreed, slaves, quote, slaves were held in defiance of the law in Wisconsin, and that an enslaved person was free as soon as he stepped across the boundary line of the territory of Wisconsin. So as soon as, in essence, as soon as Alex and the other girl stepped into Wisconsin, they were free. Uh, to Governor Dodge. So this gives Matthews, uh, again, it supports his case that you can't have slavery in Wisconsin. Um, and he goes, and this, this is what brings him to uh, December of 1841. In, in that December, he, he arrives in Platteville, Matthews, and he goes up to um, Mitchell's house, knocks on the door, and he asks Mitchell if he held slaves. And Mitchell, this is this is from his, uh, a letter that he wrote in 1849. Mitchell, 1848, I see. Mitchell says, uh, I do not hold slaves, but my wife holds two. They are given to her. Matthews responds, it is a thousand dollar penalty, madam, for anyone to hold slaves. Um, in the, <coughs> slaves in our territory. And Mitchell responds, my wife knows the law. So he didn't even let his wife respond. Now remember, Letitia, they were this, Alice and Nellie girl were actually owned by Letitia as well. But Mitchell was doing all the talking to his family. So in the conversation 
wouldn't have gone on much longer than that. Obviously, they're at an impasse. And uh, Matthews leaves, and uh, but he's got to you got to give him credit. Uh, he leaves, and he uh, he comes back to um, Galena in the spring around around April of 1842. And when he's in when he's in um, Galena, there's a there there was a black community in Galena as well. And they uh, they alerted to uh, alerted uh, Matthews to the fact that James Mitchell had taken Alice to Galena, put her on a on a steamboat, and sent her back to hardcore slavery in Missouri. Um, there's a little chronology I put together for you. So he, Matthews confronts James Mitchell and two, about the two slaves, Alice and the girl, for the girl. On March 8th, that's when the first steamboats arrived in Galena, so navigation is open. So Whatever took place with, with uh, Matthews and, and Mitchell had to take place after that. Um, and in April, Matthews visits Galena, and that's when, of course, the black community informs about Alice. And then he proceeds, Matthews proceeds to Platteville, where he found outraged black lead miners and local other residents concerned about Alice and being sent south to slavery. And they attempt to raise $50. Basically, they wanted to raise $50 to send a lawyer down to. Uh, uh, Missouri to uh, bring Alice back, but they, they couldn't raise the fifty dollars, so that, that was the end of it. And then um, later in eighteen forty-two, Mitchell sends the other enslaved girl, unknown name girl, to St. Louis as well. The same year, in the summer of eighteen forty-two, ironically, Caroline Quarles, an escaped slave from St. Louis, makes her way from St. Louis up to Milwaukee, where the Underground Railroad. People there in Milwaukee help her make her way to freedom in Canada. So it's 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 bizarre. You think about it. James Mitchell is sending two young girls back to hard slavery in Missouri, um, and uh, Caroline Quarles is helped by Underground Railroad individuals in Eastern Wisconsin, in this case Milwaukee, to freedom. So it's ironic but sad. Um, so that's that's where that's where we are. And at the time. Um, Matthews is he's he's sort of in a quandary of what to do, but when he's in Galena, believe it or not, he runs into another case of, of slavery, and this was um, John Brown, uh, a local a black man who lived in Galena. He was um, uh, he had tried to he was married to a lady named Hannah Brown, and she had a child. Well, Hannah Brown was a slave. Their child was, and they and their owner, William J. Madden, sold them in April of 1842, sold them back in the sun down in Missouri. And and while they're in Galena, it's according to the account here, um, uh, John Brown and, and Hannah sued for her release, but they didn't win. But, so they were sold anyway. But the point is though, John Brown approaches Matthews, has his documentation from this court. And about about him uh, about her being sent south and so and so Matthews takes that to Mineral Point and presents it to the grand jury. This is what he wants his documentation. He presents it to the grand jury, and uh, he uh, uh, the grand jury even he even brings up John Brown to testify in favor of his wife there, and the grand jury simply refuses to even listen to the case because of uh, after they first read over the paperwork, but then they wouldn't listen to John Brown because. And uh, the case dropped there, but you know, God bless him. Um, uh, uh, Matthews did attempt to get Hannah Brown and her child back. They, they basically disappeared uh, from history. He did actually also confront Matt. He went to his house, knocked on his door, and asked him about the Hannah Brown and her uh, child. And uh, Matt, uh, <coughs> Matt says. Uh, I, I allow no one to interfere with my domestic arrangements, and that was a good conversation. Um, so that was, and Dr. James Campbell out of Platteville called William J. Madden a grand rascal or scoundrel. So that sort of tells you something about Madden. In any case, that, that case goes nowhere, unfortunately. But uh, uh, in, the, in the meantime, wherever Matthews is going around, not only Wisconsin, but he's going around uh, 
uh, southwest Wisconsin. And this is this is this birth. It, it's almost unbelievable. He goes around southwest Wisconsin preaching against slavery, and he um, he goes to Mineral Point twice. Uh, they poured water on him and they threw eggs at him there, and they. Um, the, a mob was gathering with armed with clubs and he left town. Um, in fair play, little fair play, just south of here, um, he was confronted by a mob who was preaching in a, uh, in a church there against slavery. And he was uh, confronted by a mob. Eggs, as he says, eggs came thick and fast from every part of the room at him. In Lancaster, he just finished uh, anti slavery speech in the courthouse. And a rock came through an open window, hit him in the leg, and he got out of the courthouse and went over to uh, under the protection of Joseph Mills and his shotgun and kept the mob at, at bay while he went off to safety. And in Potosi, he actually had a, um, and made the newspapers here, he had a, uh, a give and take session in Potosi where he, uh, about slavery and the slavery, the whole thing, and how, how bad it was. And, and in the town, and basically the newspaper calls him an imported abolitionist. Remember, he was from England originally. And after that day, they basically ran him out of town, and, they, and the paper mentions if he didn't leave, they would have brought him out on a fence trail. And then he even shows up in Platteville. And that was quite contentious. And uh, the local group there, I'm not sure exactly who they were yet, but they mentioned they had they resolved that, quote, that it was, it was, it is dishonest and disorganizing to form societies in the North having for their object the abolition of slavery without compensation to the masters. And that's where he left it. But it's, it's pretty sad if you think about it. Here this man is trying to end slavery and these people are doing everything they can to, uh, in a way, protect it. Uh, as far as uh, is Matthew's, what he does, in, in, he's sort of at a loss, again, uh, James, James, uh, William Madden sold Hannah. Alice is down, in, Alice and Ellie Girl are down in St. Louis. And then in the, in the summer, in August of 1842, Wisconsin Territorial Anti-Slavery Society was established in Delaware. And that, that was a turning point for him. That, again, this is, a religious, this is primarily a religious, a religious space, so mostly ministers attend this in it members. And, and so now, now Edward had his, his platform, his avenue to go after James. And so for the next six years, he, he, how, he pursues James like a bulldog through the Wisconsin Territory and the Slavery Society. And he, uh, uh, every meeting, he brings it up. He brings up the fact that James had, had uh, slaves. And what are we going to do about it? They sent him down to Missouri. What are we going to do about it? Finally, in 1844, he corners Mitchell in the sense that he got Mitchell to, to admit that, okay, two slaves had been given to his wife uh, with the proviso in the deed that if ever she parted from them, she should send them back to her father who gave them. And then, quoting James here, he says, James admits, I brought them, the girls, with me to Wisconsin, and after living some years here as they desired to go south, I can't quite believe that one. Uh, I took one of them in my buggy, carried her to Galena, and paid her fare to St. Louis. And I afterwards sent off the other. And I would do so again to the tenth time. So he's he basically unrepentant. He, in his mind, he's done the right thing. He hasn't done anything illegal uh, in sending those girls back to slavery in, um, in Missouri. But he got him to, to admit to this. And now he rides this statement for but took another three years. Um, in the meantime, James actually leaves, leaves uh, about 18, early 1843, he leaves Platteville. Um, and he, more than likely, that no one ever wrote it down, but I don't believe it's a coincidence that this man, who had a house, had a job here, he was a minister, had a 720 acre farm, had a business, just how some believes. That's not a coincidence, folks. He, he, uh, the people of Platteville are outraged at what he'd done in sending to the road back to Missouri. And so he ends up in Southport, which is Kenosha uh, today, and uh, in Racine and, and eventually Milwaukee. And finally, actually, in 1846, he, he becomes a minister um, in the ME Church in Chicago. 
Finally, in 1847, Matthews is able to bring in his evidence. He actually had other people interview people in the Bible about James and whatnot. And he brings it to the grand, county grand jury. And uh, they, they read over his paperwork and they said, thanks, but we're not pursuing this. And that was, you know, he, he did his best, but he couldn't get anything out of it. Um, so they refused to hear the case as well. Um, 18, um, 1848, believe it or not, Mitchell, uh, this came from a county history book, but it's, it, it's, it's backed up by uh, other documentation. Mitchell was actually, he brought the two girls from Missouri back up to Chicago. And they were living with him in Chicago. And, and he was prosecuted for harboring runaway slaves in Chicago, but found not guilty. Finally, in 1850, he moved to St. Louis and he stayed in the South the rest of his life. Um, and so he's, uh, that was the end of James Mitchell in Wisconsin completely in the Midwest. He, um, this is a letter. The, the upper thing is, the upper caption there is a letter that Mitchell never accepted the girls are free in Wisconsin. Um, in that 1848 case, in the Illinois Chicago case there, he says in a letter to a lawyer, he said, the prosecution intends to show that I, learning from Judge Charles Dunn, that they, the slaves, Alice and the other girl, were free, then I determined to send them off. This is false. He just never gave up on the thought that, that he couldn't do this. Um, and he, um, he ends up a Methodist minister, uh, 1850s and 60s censuses. He's in Missouri, and um, he, he actually fights in the Confederate Army. He dies in 1872. But you look in the lower, the lower left there. That's the uh, slave schedule for 1850, uh, and that's James Mitchell. They didn't list the names of the slave names, unfortunately. But the first slave, she's 26 female and mulatto. That's the M. That's what the M stands for. Um, and uh, the the second one there is 17. I think those are the two girls. Alice is probably the 26 year old. And then the 17 year old. So they get back 10 years and they would have been 16 and 7 or thereabouts um, in 1840 when all this was going on at the, at the, um, at the lead smelter and stuff and being sent to St. Louis. So they were fairly young. Um, and uh, James just didn't seem to have any, any care for them. He, uh, final thoughts on this. If you look at, uh, if we'll first look at, at Matthews. Before Matthews showed up, uh, slavery was tolerated in Wisconsin, right, in this area. Um, there was, uh, at least the census didn't show any other slaves other than Grant and Iowa counties, and it was tolerated. After Matthews left, he left in 1847, in the fall after the Grant County debacle, um, and he, he took a tour of the U.S. eventually, and then in the early 1850s, he goes back to England. Um, but um, all of those people, uh, the number of six slave owners that were listed in the census, by 18, two years later, by 1842, Thomas Parrish, uh, Brayden Bush, Jonathan Cray, and Edward Lapper um, have all left. They're, they're simply gone. They're not in Wisconsin anymore. I don't know about what happened to their slaves. They, but they were nameless, of course, they were just numbers. Um, but those four guys left the left town. Um, William Madden, of course, is, he leaves by 1847. He sold, of course, he sold Anna and her child back to slavery. And then Roundtree and Philip Thomas had freed their slaves. So all six slave owners had, had taken either left town or had freed their slaves. So Matthews did have an impact in slavery. From that time on, uh, I haven't found any slaves in Grant County or anywhere in this area. Um, James Mitchell, if you look at James, the, he treated the girls, you know, you have that one account where they're sleeping on the floor, so he, he treated the girls poorly at home. He forced them to work in a dangerous lead smelter. Um, and then he sends them back to St. Louis, um, and all the statements that he makes, he just shows absolutely no remorse for what he's done. He's, in his mind, he's right. You know, he, he just he thought of these girls as uh, not full-fledged human beings. There were tools in his mind. He had every right to do, send them to a dangerous lead smelter if he wanted to, or send them back to slavery. Um, the local, but to the, to the benefit of this area here, 
there, there had to been a local outrage over Mitchell sending these bills to Missouri because all of a sudden he just leaves. He, he sells off all of his property and he's gone. Um, I'm sure he came back and visited family now and then, but he never uh, put down roots here again. And of course, he lost his job here as well. Um, sells his farm and his house. Um, he pursued, uh, of course, Reverend Matthews pursues him for six years. Uh, and he was tried for Harvard and Williams in Chicago, and he ends up living relatively poor, living in Houston, Texas, a Houston, Texas hotel with his wife, with his wife, Keisha. And so she, they end up, um, yeah, he's, but in every sense, it's interesting enough, he's always a, a, a minister of the gospel or whatever, a right? minister, so he never left his profession. But he, uh, he definitely lost a lot for, for his belief system there. I want to thank you for listening. Um, and then for you, the next one will be in uh, October 22nd, 2020 at 7 p.m., the same kind of a Zoom arrangement. And in that one, I'm going to introduce you to Sister Rachel. Yes, yeah, fascinating lady. And how she plays in with the Roundtree situation and, and perhaps ameliorating that situation. Um, so I invite you to that one, and, and thanks for listening. Okay, so uh, Jen Casper asks, what year did the Platteville Founding Fathers decide to lift up both Roundtree and Mitchell families despite their slave ownership? In other words, celebrate the families, I guess. Uh, with, um, with, Round, with, with Mitchell, actually, with Samuel Mitchell, um, you have to remember one thing about Samuel and Eleanor and, and the and the Roundtree or the Mitchell Roundtree of some kinds, no slaves were ever at the cottage. You know that Henry was Henry Christopher was not a uh, slave. But uh Samuel was actually considered uh as early as 1845, a person called him sort of like the father of Wisconsin. Uh, the uh, uh so he was he was revered really right from the start because he was so old, he was born in 1764. And you know, the 1840s and stuff, you know, he was in his he's in his 80s and stuff, and he was uh, people just didn't live that long at that time, so he was really thought well of. With John Roundtree, he uh he was thought well of pretty much by the 18 well, the 1840s and 50s, as far as I can tell. I mean, I haven't found any um I even found one account where where uh the person Roundtree actually was in a lawsuit against this one person, several people actually. And Roundtree was one of the one of the uh, lawsuit persons, and the person that wrote about him actually didn't write about Roundtree. He wrote about actually William Madden and said Madden was a scoundrel. Versus he didn't say anything about Roundtree as far as being bad. Every account I've found about Roundtree, he's at least by the contemporaries, um, is. Uh, as late as 1916, Martin Rinlob wrote, wrote a piece where he basically praised Brown. And Martin would have known Roundtree. Martin was a young man during the Civil War, so he was younger than Roundtree, but uh, he was a newspaper editor. And uh, he uh, wrote nicely of Roundtree. So Roundtree was well thought of uh, probably from the 1840s onward, easily. Thank you. So Joyce Boss asks, uh, just to be clear, James Mitchell was not the builder of the stone cottage, right? Correct, Joyce. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, no, uh, uh, to my knowledge, that uh, the stone cottage, well, I believe John H. Roundtree was involved in it. Um, and of course, Samuel probably supervised it, you know, um, but he, uh, it's definitely what makes the Stone Cottage interesting is it is a Virginia sort of tidewater house in the middle of the Midwest. It is unusual. When you see that, if you know architecture at all, when you see that, you're thinking that's Wisconsin, and it is Wisconsin. And and it doesn't. If you of course know the history, then you realize, oh, that person came. The owner, the original owner, came from. Virginia. That explains the architectural style of that house. But no, James Mitchell did not have anything to do with the construction that, that I'm aware of. 
Got it. So the Mitchell that's being referred to is Samuel, his father. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mitchell. In, in terms of if, if you were to define it in, the, in that in that way, or uh, the Mitchell round from Songhai Mitchell refers to Samuel, Samuel, Eleanor Mitchell, and Roundtree wouldn't return. Wouldn't really refer to John Roundtree. He owned it for a few years, but he sells it and gives it to Hiram. Hiram Roundtree, his son, Sophia. Hiram and Sophia lived there uh, for years. Hiram dies in 1884, and then um, Sophia lives there till 1912, I think, when she died. And then her daughter takes over, Laura. So the round tree is, you could say, is named after Hiram, Sophia, and Laura. Thank you. Terry asks, James, do you know anything about the relationship between the few free blacks in Platteville, like America Jenkins, and any of the uh, people you talked about? My understanding is that there was also a mulatto girl who lived with a family who wanted her to attend Platteville Academy, and that the Academy president, Josiah Pickard, supported this, but Southern sympathizers prevented this. Uh, Terry says, Roundtree, I believe, founded the Academy. I'd love to hear how these histories are intertwined with those you've talked about, if you've run into any possible connections. Well, um, yes. <laughs> I could go on for an hour on that. Um, uh, America Jenkins never lived in Platteville. America Jenkins lived, she was from Kentucky, and she uh, uh, then probably went to Missouri, and then eventually, I believe, it comes up to Potosi. A man named Asa Huff brought her up here, uh, and she she ends up uh, her owner. She was a slave. Her owner actually tried to take her south. That's another story that I'm going to I'm going to delve into a little bit in my next presentation. But she, her owner actually tried to take her south. They dragged her right through the streets of Potosi with her children, and she was screaming and whatnot, trying to say no. And the locals put a stop to. There's three accounts of this that were written by three different people who did not know each other, so it happened. Um, so, and then she ends up in Lancaster uh, with the Joel Allen Barber family. Um, Joel Allen Barber, uh, if you look at, especially 19th century people, they, they, there was a sense, if you're looking for the, go on and on, but uh, I'll leave it go with this. Uh, she, she goes to, uh, she goes to uh, Lancaster, lives with the Barber family, and then ends up living um, about eight, roughly about after the war, after the Civil War, probably 1865, 66. She goes out and lives with the Shepherd family in Pleasant Ridge, and then she dies sometime, I'm thinking, around 1869, because she's not in the 1870 census at all. Um, the, the story of the young mulatto girl. Um, who tried that? That took place in 1859, and uh, she came here. And I researched it. And she she ended up she applied to the school, Platteville Academy, and she uh, she was accepted. And then and then somewhere down the line, the board or someone found out. Of course, she uh, how to how to pick it. Pick it supported it completely. You could put it that the board had found out that she had a strain of Negro blood in her. That's some sort of quote. Right there. Um, and uh, they didn't like it. The, some of the locals didn't like it. And perhaps some of the students, because there were several students from the South. But it, in the long run, she, she uh, the, the, the board meets, and they actually, they reject, they, they reject it. And they say, no, you're not, you're not going to attend here because she's black, basically. Um, and, then, and then Pickard finds out about it. And he's sick, unfortunately, at this time. He's sicker than a dog. And he, uh, but he gets out of bed and he, he writes a letter, I guess, to the board and says, either you admit her or I'm gone. I'm not going to teach her. I'm not going to be the principal and, and uh, be the administrator of, the, of this school. And so the board re-meets and they say, oh, okay, okay, we're allow her. But by that time, she had left and moved to, I think, it was, I think it was Pennsylvania. So it's a very sad case. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's another case. To my knowledge, yeah, I don't, uh, there isn't a lot on the case. I, I tried so hard to find her name once, but it just, you know, it, it's almost impossible. But I believe it, I believe it happened. Yeah, for sure. So that's another long question that we're we'll have to get into one of these days. 
Uh, Bill Bryan asks, uh, when was an anti-slavery society formed in Platteville? Um, none to my knowledge. They, they uh, I mean, there have been, there were people against slavery, no doubt about it, but they did try to form that, that anti-slavery society in um, 1842 or 43 in Platteville, but it didn't fly. Um, that's where Matthews did try to form it, but it just didn't, uh, the locals didn't go for it, unfortunately. Um, they, they had, uh, as, as, as the quote says, uh, they had this idea that you don't want to, to um, take away this, you know, form a society that's going to take away a person's property. Because if you look at, they look at, if you're looking at these unfortunate individuals as property, that's, that's how you're looking at it. But, uh, to my knowledge, uh, not to say there wasn't one, but I haven't found one yet that was specifically an anti-slavery society. In my Jacqueline Thomas asks, I'm wondering if there is anything in the historical rep record supporting the Grant County Herald reports of Wolfolk and Oldham families being slaveholders in Potosi, or Asa Hugh. Yeah, Asa Hough. Is a how? Yeah, Huff. Yeah, H H O U G H Huff. Um, yeah, that there's a there's a there's an account uh, in in the 1863 newspaper in February. I think I can look it up. Um, there's an account about about that there, you'd, and you'd have to I'd have to look at the census. I, I just can't. I, I, but I don't recall them having listed with having, uh, well, there might have been. I'd have to look at the since. I just can't say off the top of my head right at the moment. But they're there, uh, but I know they come up with you talking about. Okay, Tamara asks, uh, James, it seems disingenuous of the slave owner to claim that the slaves belong to his wife in 1841 before a married women's property law in Wisconsin. Do you have any insight into why he did so? Um, good question. He, that, and that question came up, I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to delve into it legally. That question came up in all of the, um, the uh, all the proceedings within the anti-slavery society where, where Matthews was pursuing Mitchell. That question came up where, could he even say that she owns the slaves? This is Wisconsin and, and she can't own property like that. And, and so, it, but it wasn't resolved then. Um, but no, it it, uh, it wasn't it just wasn't resolved. But yeah, she why he did it. Uh, obviously, I mean, to me, he was he was the patriarch of his family, and um, he was protecting his wife in that sense. Now we're looking at it it's, in a way he's throwing his wife on a bus, so it makes it well, they're not mine, they're my wife's. But uh, but yeah, it, it's it was just his way of perhaps protecting his family. Sort of sad, but that's, you know. But that was, if you think about it, they, they gave both Samuel Mitchell's wife, Henry Christopher, and stuff, they were given to Eleanor. But, free, but he, he was a strong enough person, obviously in his family, Samuel Mitchell, he wouldn't free them, whereas James uh, just wouldn't do that. And, and in my estimation, he didn't want to. He just, he, he just didn't want to. So he didn't. Okay, Sarah Lomaz Flesh asks, can you tell us more about the Second Great Awakening? Um, that's, uh, yeah, good question. Um, not an expert on that. But uh, that started, that was, that was in the latter 1700s, in the early 1800s. And it went on until 1835, 40, right in there. And it, it was a movement, it was a religious movement. Um, you know, the first Great Awakening, which starts back like in 1735, way back, um, uh, John Wesley was his name that really led that. He was an Episcopalian, he becomes a Methodist, and then he starts that. Um, but uh, the second one was, it was a sort of more of a, it was religious, and more than people attending church more, and, and of course joined church and that kind of thing. Uh, and they, uh, it was it also had a reform element to it. It, it had anti-slavery. Uh, it was trying to get certain rights for women. Um, 
and various other uh, prison reform was another one, that kind of thing. So that was, it was in general, um, even you can even go back to uh, a, a person who been heavily involved with that would have been William Wilberforce, the, the great English um, anti-slavery person. And uh, before Wilberforce, you didn't have like animal rights groups and all that other thing. After Wilberforce, you did. So the Great Awakening was part of the second one was part of that as well. So that's that's what I'd say about that. Will Lassour asks, was the response from Platteville regarding the anti-slavery group a resolution by the city itself or by some other group? Some group. He, that came from uh, Matthew's autobiography, and he, he doesn't name the group. Unfortunately, I looked and looked and, and looked at others, so I couldn't find anything on it other than what he says. He doesn't name the group, unfortunately. But at one time, they, 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 the first resolution they passed was, well, they, they proposed it, they didn't pass it. They proposed it basically to kick Matthews out of the area, period. But they said, okay, that's maybe going too far. So then they passed this resolution that we don't want an anti slavery society here. Um, and he, um, so it, it, was, it was very contentious. But yeah, he, uh, I was going to say something. Anyway, he um, lost my train of thought there. But he, uh, he was he was one of those kind of people that uh, was a mover and a shaker and brought brought people brought the best and the worst out of people. I think. Fascinating. Uh, Jacqueline Thomas uh, provides a reference from Wisconsin Magazine of History on Ellen Woodell who was listed as mulatto in the census and was ejected from Platteville Academy, eventually attended school at the Rockford Seminary, uh, according to the author of this article. Okay, okay. Send me the article, would you? Good, good. I loved it. Um, okay, Ellen Woodall, huh? Okay. Yeah, Rockford, that was it. Yeah, that, it, was, it wasn't good to me. You're right, it was Rockford. There was, a, there was some sort of academy in Rockford, Illinois. Okay, um, we might uh, call and see if there are any final questions. Otherwise, that's our last written okay. question. Okay, well, in that case, let me just wrap up here. Thank you all. James, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. Such an honor to have you speaking here. Uh, for us and uh, I invite all of you to tune in uh, for Slavery and Platteville Part 2 uh, when James will speak about the Roundtree family and that's Thursday, October 22nd, 7 p.m. and uh, please uh, register on our website or feel free to give us a call for assistance. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, please keep in touch. Also, should anyone have some uh, suggestions for us on how to improve these uh, presentations in the future, don't hesitate to email or give a call. Thank you again very much. Good night.